Hello, Dr. Ian. Thank you for joining us again. Thanks, David. It's nice to be here. So we talked about a lot of stuff last time, having to do more technical kind of aspects. But um, the reason I asked you to come back this time was because um, I thought that we've been talking about some other thing. We were talking about some other stuff, and I and I was thinking about your practice, and I thought I think people would really benefit from kind of learning how you now have this big office with multiple doctors and in your area, not just in your area, probably worldwide. You're fairly famous, and people know who you are. But I know that that's not how it started. <laughs> I know I know it started day one with something much less than that. And so there's always a process of growth. And I thought if you shared kind of that process of how you grew from when you started, things went up and how you ended up going from point A to point B, that a lot of people would learn some stuff like that. And I'm sure as you think about it, you'll think of mistakes you made that you wish you had done differently. And you'll also think of things that you totally hit on the head, whether by luck or intuition or whatever that are really important to do as well. So I'll let you go ahead and just kind of start at the beginning. Like, what was it like when you, I don't even know how it went. If when you graduated, did you open an office and how did that go? Yeah, well, that's exactly what happened. We went straight into, I had a partner who was a really good buddy from college, from university. And he was approached by somebody who was selling their practice 12 months before that. And I was determined to get out of the state. Actually, I was going to move up and set up a practice in uh, Early Beach, which is in, with Sundays in Australia, it's right near the reef. So it's a beautiful part of the world. Uh, very long story short, I decided to uh, go into practice with my partner, Joe. And, you know, we had a really good relationship because we both had very similar philosophies and we were both sort of um, very well aligned in terms of w what we wanted out of a practice and, and what we saw our role being. And, we thought we were buying a practice that was seeing 180 patients a week and from an established chiropractor. Um, unfortunately, this guy was one of those people that give us a bad name. That's all I'm going to say on that topic. But, um, yeah, not the most honourable person. Um, it was not 180 patients really a week. It was a few people seeing very, very frequent, frequently. And the idea was when we started, um, my, my partner was going to do a three-week transition. And then when we took over, everyone that he'd seen, he would continue to see. Anyone that came in that he hadn't seen, I would see. And then once we were around about 50-50 split, we would just split the patients one for one. And it was a good plan. So we thought that somewhere within the first month or so, we would have about 90 patients each. Um, very naive. Um, you know, numbers on paper, they're very easy to split up. Actual human beings are a totally different story. Uh, right. <laughs> so, um, and unlucky for him, he actually, my partner, he actually was unwell the first week that we opened. And, you know, like he's a really robust character. Like he worked really hard. But I think after having five years in uni and helping at his family business and, you know, setting up the practice and everything, he just kind of crashed. For a week so um yeah so basically these people had a practitioner that they that, you know we were told they loved and then all of a sudden they met this new guy which was my partner joe and then um before we knew it i was just walking in cold and seeing these people fresh and so yeah we at that point thought we were pretty much destined to go broke we um We'd borrowed a bit of money off my mum who didn't have any money. My dad died when I was 11, so we, my mum had nothing. So she gave us all of her nothing, which was about 10000 And we got a bit of a loan and we paid the outgoing chiropractor rental on his drop piece tables until our stuff was ready. So we really were just starting from bare basics. And uh, a very interesting thing happened. Uh, we, I got into the, you know, I, as I just told you, I had to start seeing all the patients myself. So every single person I met was a stranger to me and I was a stranger to them. And the, I know I, what I should tell you was we were told by anyone that we asked, don't change anything. If you, you're just going to start this, you know, buy a practice off somebody else, change very little because you'll go um, broke very quickly and, you know, the patients will leave and you'll end up with nothing. So that's that's the sort of mindset that we had when we went in. But, you know, this guy practiced very differently to how we had um, 
been practicing. Like Joe and I both attended every Gonstead seminar from early in college onwards. We had got all our instruction from Alex Cox and, you know, Poe and Bill Dressler and John Cox and these good people. Um, and then we had all the benefit of the really good Australian guys too, who, you know, they all had gone to the States to get their original qualifications and come back here. So they were very passionate. Um, and Joe and I had committed ourselves to this um, Gonster technique from very early. Um, you know, we we're both lucky to be alive by the time we finished university from practicing on each other. Um, but here's the thing. Patient after patient. Oh, by the way, I should quickly say, and I hope I'm not boring anybody, but it seems relevant to me. The the, the um, outgoing practitioner, he basically had a big open plan room, and he had a couple of drop piece tables, and people would just lay down, face down, fully clothed, and then he'd climb all over them or do whatever he did, and then, um, and a lot of them were on family plans, and these are all things we learnt later. So it was like the opposite to the practice that we envisaged ourselves um practicing in the one of the be benefits of this practice was it was in uh, the western suburbs which is kind of a lower socioeconomic area in melbourne but it was it filled a big void like three hours to the west there was a constead person and there was another couple of constead people you know within a an hour drive in different directions and a couple of the um old chiropractic original chiropractic families is the Hart brothers and they um, were probably another 50 minutes away or something. So it was kind of made sense for us to put ourselves in this place. Um, but we had to overcome the challenge of these um, patients that had been looked after in a very different way to how we intended. So a theme started. As soon as I started seeing patients, I realized about four or five people in that they'd been seen many, many, many times, many times. And, you know, a few years down the track, they were still seeing, being seen many times. And so I started to ask the question, um, you know, what brought you in and how are you doing? And the vast majority of them said, yeah, look, it's pretty good. Um, I like coming here, but as, as for why I came here, I've still got my original complaint. And, and this was person after person. And so... I didn't know anything about, you know, wellness dialogue and things like that back then, but I found out later why they were still happy to come along, even though they didn't feel like they were really improving in their health. But, um, you know, I just started to say to these people, would you be prepared to try something different? And they'd say, well, yeah, maybe. And I'd pick up the nervous scope and I introduced that. I told them what Gonstead was. I told them that, you know, analysis of the skin is very important to us because we look for temperature changes either side of the spine and we look for fluid and edema and muscle symmetry and other postural um, correlations. And, you know, I explained the story. And then I, the first patient I did this to was a lady and I said, you know, would you mind if I stepped out and you put on a gown so that I could check your spine properly and we'll see what we can find? And she said, no, that would that'd be great. Um the next three patients were identical to that. And then from then on, I developed a complete different approach. I just walked into the room and say, hi, I'm me, and do you want to try something different? And it was, it just went like that patient after patient after patient. And the overwhelming thing was just how well people accepted true chiropractic, even when it was practiced by someone straight out of university. And um, you know, just giving them like caring about them and them only and putting into practice what I, you know, studied really hard to, to be able to provide um, with the assistance of all those good people over the years um, and just doing it from the heart. It was literally amazing how quickly and easily people accepted Gonstead Chiropractic uh, when we were told they wouldn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you want me to keep talking, but I've got, obviously I can add to that or. I'm wondering, I'm wondering from a different angle, as far as you personally, at that point, did you feel like you were perfectly capable of taking care of these people? Or were you like a lot of young doctors where it's like, you've got your head above water, but your dog paddling like mad because you know, at any moment it might go under. Um, yeah. where, did you have that sensation? 
Yeah, probably somewhere in between. Like I, I had a, um, I was quite confident in my abilities at the time, um, but I was also, um, I had a leveled, I, I guess, a, a, a measured, uh, um, like I, I wasn't, I wasn't, I was aware that I didn't know everything, that's for sure. And I was aware that, you know, one false move and it could um, turn <laughs> nasty. Um, yeah. But I had a couple of advantages. I was a registered nurse for quite some time. And so I, I'd been around sick people before. And I think that for uh, people new to any form of healthcare and new graduates, I think one of the toughest things is to be in the space of another human and like actually, um, you know, bridge that gap of personal space and being able to interact in the, 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 the close spaces that you need to be in to really help somebody. Um, I was, I was, I guess I'd had practice with that and I was more comfortable, I was comfortable. Uh, the other thing was, I was fortunate enough, I think in first year to um, pay, uh, spend my only $50 literally that I had and get on a bus and go 10 hours up north to Sydney to attend my first Gonstead seminar. And, you know, a, this is a true story. Like I actually just bunked in with a couple of other people in a backpacker's place and I literally slept on this you know moldy old carpet without a without a mattress or a sheet and for for the weekend and um yeah that was my first Gonstead seminar with Alex Cox and those guys and a couple of things happened on that that seminar the first thing was I was just really really shift like I, I really felt a deep shift when I met those original Gonstead people like there was just this this air of um, genuine truth that came off the stage and um, you know I'd been in the health profession for 12 years at that point and I'd, I'd never really seen anyone that just exuded a truth like that like it was just like someone speaking their truth and I'd been to every seminar you can imagine up until that point because I I borrowed a lot of money when I started college and I decided I was going to go to every chiropractic seminar at least twice which I did do um, but I was becoming more and more disillusioned with chiropractic the more seminars I did and um, even though I could see some value in some of them it was actually starting to tug at my enthusiasm for doing this thing for the rest of my life. Uh, I was lucky that I saw really good chiropractors as a child. Um, I hadn't seen them for 10 years or something, but I had, I, you know, these memories started dropping back in. I'm like, oh yeah, Peter and Chris, they talked about that or they did that or they did this to me. And I sort of started to kind of connect um, those experiences. But the one thing, yeah, the first thing was getting that just major deep shift by seeing the just the genuine, um, just humility, grace, and real palpable ex like knowledge that was coming out of Alex uh, on stage. Um, and the second thing was um, John Cox was um, very dedicated at the time to teaching technique very well on the floor. And through his coaching, uh, actually in this first seminar, I got managed to correct my first atlas um, subluxation on a on a mate of mine who was very unwell at the time. He had terrible migraines and he was quite dizzy and he, he wasn't feeling good at all. And so that was my first. I was very lucky to get my first look at a primary subluxation at my first seminar, and also to get coached through making um you know a fairly decent correction on it like obviously nothing like what i would get today or what you would get but um at that point and then there was this huge shift in in my friend john so um at that point i decided i'm not going to get out of this university without being able to move every level of the spine one way or another without compromise and i'm definitely not going to if I, if I can't correct this thing in a neutral joint space, I'm going to go to another table or another approach. I'm never going to take it to end feel range of motion. Um, and I just made myself that promise. And no matter how hard it was, 
um, that's what I was going to stick to. So we did manage to do that. And the other thing that I'd throw in there, and this is, I think, good advice for any student or, yeah, probably student, is treat student clinic as if it's your own practice. That's what I did. Uh, I I didn't inherit many patients when I went into student clinic. And, you know, the obligations on us to, you know, tick things off on were were quite high. We had to see a lot of new patients and a lot of returns and take a lot of x-rays at the time. So um, the only way that I got through that quite quickly was by um, I treated, I decided to treat the student clinic as if it was my own practice. And that was how I, um, yeah, that, that was basically where I got my first experience in really educating patients and telling them why why I'm there and helping them understand why they were there and um, being very dedicated to apply the Gonstead system to their care, even in student clinic. And, um, you know, I got a lot of referrals and then sort of those referrals gave referrals. So um, all of, if I put all that together, I would say I was, I was probably ready to start a practice on my own. But having said that, um, I think Joe and I probably, if there was a good Gonstead person that were looking for associates, we probably would have done that at the time. But at the but when we were out, um, it was either go and practice a way that you didn't quite align with, or start your own. Yeah, that's what I had as well. Yeah. Yeah. So you were you're in the first. I, I don't even know what the first year maybe of of that practice. Um, how long did you go along like that? Just, just doing what we do, plugging ahead, seeing the patients before anything started to change or before you started to see any growth or, or anything really changed in the practice? Well, that's why I sort of introed with that little story earlier about, um, you know, the way we took over the practice and the way Joe was unwell for the first week. Um, the reason that was relevant to me was um, we planned on having about 90 patients each. But after that first week, I would say Joe probably still had the majority because the, the, the exiting chiropractor had scheduled everyone in his books in for that last three-week transition. Um, so Joe had seen most people. Um, and some of those stayed with me because I saw them in the first week. But other than that, the rest stayed with Joe. So um, we were actually starting from a very low base. And we... We took some advice that uh, Alex said in one of the seminars. He said, you know, um, buy an x-ray machine before you pay yourself. And we we went and did that. We all ordered, you know, two full sets of uh, Gonstead equipment and an x-ray machine, um, you know. And, you know, at that point, we were splitting $250 at the end of the week. So, um, but that would be advice I'd definitely give to people starting out, like, you know, um, don't overcommit yourself. Like, you know, don't, don't, you know, just wait, wait, wait for nice things because when you're starting out in chiropractic, the most fun you'll have in your life is getting better at it. And the, and the most joy you'll get out of life is getting people well. So, you know, there's nothing that's going to compete with that. Like, you know, a, a nicer car or a new boat or whatever it's, none of those things are going to feel as good as getting better and getting people well. So just put your time into that. And if you have to borrow money for something, borrow it for something that's going to make the care of the patient um, more complete. Like, you know, again, the x-ray machine, good equipment. Um, yeah, so that was us. We, we actually rented the old chiropractor's tables for the first three months. Um, we paid him a certain amount of money. I can't remember how much. Um, it was a lot. It was extortion. But anyway, <laughs> um, we did it. And But the good, the thing that Joe and I had is we had a really strong mutual respect. And um, if, if he was seeing a patient and I was writing a letter or creating a template for, for you know, some communication to the patient base or, or vice versa, we just respected each, every, all work was equal, and we, and as long as we were both doing something, we, all work was respected. So I think that was good. Um, we were told 
by the exiting chiropractor that we should keep these appointments that he'd made in supermarkets to go and do screenings. And uh, those screenings didn't really align with us, but um, we did them anyway because, we, you know, we took the advice of this guy. Um, I think for some people they might work. For us, they were useless because, you know, I was basically, by the time I'd finished with somebody, they didn't need to come and see me. I'd given them everything. <laughs> 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 um, there was yeah apart from I, I think I gave them everything short of an adjustment in those supermarket, converse, supermarket conversations um, but one thing that I'm really pleased that we did and one thing that I think worked really well was we had a an awareness early on of the true value of a lifetime patient and I think that's something that's missed these days, like these practice marketing um, seminars and workshops. They, they're sort of very numbers focused and, um, and, and financial focused, but I, I really don't think that you do well in Gonstead Chiropractic unless um, you just trust that those things are going to take care of themselves. You, you have to start with a love. Like what I think I had, which was a massive advantage, is what we both had, I think, is a love for the profession. And we also had a tremendous respect for the people that had gone before us. So um, we were really aware that we were only able to do what we were doing because other people had done it tougher before we came along. And... Um, and we had a lot of reverence and a lot of respect for that. And I, I would say to anybody, even if you've been out 20 years and things aren't going as well as you probably would like them to, just circle back around and, and start with the, a, a love and respect for the profession and really get intimate with what it is you're trying to do for the patient. Like, why are you there? What What's the patient coming to you for? What's your expertise? Um you know, if there are some holes in your game, you know, what can you do better to find the subluxation? What can you do better to correct it? And because that was, and realize that it's a life's work. It doesn't end. And I, I think I was just very lucky at the start that I had that point of view. That was my focus. Um, you know, there are times when the bills come in and you're forced to look at money and you think, shit, mate, you better you better change your focus. But luckily, <laughs> luckily we didn't, you know, we, we just stuck to our guns. We trusted that. Oh, and look, another thing that was good and kind of funny looking back is we, so Joe and I and my partner and two kids at the time all lived in a, in a residence attached to the practice, like all of us. And it was just, it was, it was like a 1940s um, dairy, the building originally. So the practice side was quite renovated and nice. And then you just walk back into this like time warp as you, you know, you walk through the door into where we all lived. Um, you know, before we got smart, we used to do our x-ray servicing and, you know, clean all the chemicals out of the x-ray developing room in the bath and, um, oh, wow! <laughs> yeah, and then yeah, one day I started. I was thinking, you know, are my children going to turn green or something if we? So we stopped doing that. But um, yeah, it was a real family affair, and we were we would just, you know, I'd have to go in sometimes and say, you know, do you reckon we could keep it down to a dull roar because the patients are thinking someone's getting killed in there, and we it. It was it was a big it was a bit of a job to sort of manage the practice and the accommodation and everybody's life. But the good thing about that was that the one thing that I think saved us in the early days was all of the elect the utilities bills were paid for out of the practice, so we didn't have to then go and rent a place and pay for bills. Mm -hmm. um, so that took a bit of pressure off. That's how we could split two hundred and fifty dollars and still survive to go back the next week. The other thing that Joe and I had was a we we had this kind of attitude that we're going to be there when the patients want us. 
And I think that's really important too. And, um, you know, we, we could have been there for 10 hours and be packing up ready to go. We get a phone call saying, look, I'm an hour away, but I need to be seen. And we'd say, yeah, just come down. And it wouldn't matter what time that was. Um, you know, I remember on a Saturday, our actual hours like were eight o'clock to um, four o'clock in the afternoon. But it was not uncommon at all to finish up, drive down the road 15 minutes, get a phone call, go back to the practice, see an emergency, lock up again, drive home 15 minutes, get another call, turn around and come back. I remember one Saturday, I was still there at midnight, just seeing another emergency or somebody else that, you know. And look, to some extent that we probably created a job for ourselves because people knew that we would see them. Uh, I think sometimes they would hurt themselves in a football match, go and have 10 beers, party with their friends and then call us up, but <laughs> so be it. <laughs> <laughs> How long did you kind of go along like that before you felt like you hit that, you know, that hump in the practice where it's like you no longer feel like you have to just kick with all your might to keep it going uphill, but now it's starting to coast a little long, a little bit. How, did, how long did you have to work like that? Look, it did take a while, David, I would, because one thing that um, I was very fortunate with, and I still am, I I always got a lot of referrals. And so I there was also, there was always a steady stream of new patients through by referral. Um, I don't think all that's based on my skill base because, um, I mean, these days it's different, but back then... Um, I think the main thing was people knew that if I could help them, I'd say I help. I would help them. And if I didn't think I could help them, they knew that I would tell them I didn't think I could. So I think they knew they had that honesty with me. Um, but the biggest thing is they knew I cared. Like, And I would say that to anybody, whether you've been out five minutes or 50 years, um, it, it's got to start with how much you care and not just about the person, but you've got to care about, you got to have respect for the power of the subluxation and the power of the correction, power of the adjustment. Um, you got to care about those things, and you've got to. It, it probably sounds corny to some, but you you got to care about the world. You got to care about the universe. You got to care about. You got to care, and <laughs> people people will remember how much you care probably more than they'll remember anything else, and. So that's definitely, and, and, and if they sense that you care about things that aren't um, deep in nature, like if they, if they sense that you care more about something material or you care about, you know, progressing your, your life or progressing your, um, you know, your notoriety or how famous you are or things like that, like people will, um, their their inbuilt wisdom will sort of pull them away from you because they'll know that, that that you're not the best place for them, and they might hang they might hang in that person's space for a little while, um, but eventually the subconscious will take the person away. They'll take them somewhere else. I don't know if that makes sense, but that that's sort of how my mind works. You you're always talking. This is probably worth saying to people starting out you're always talking to the person subconscious. So if you think you're talking to the front of their mind, um, yeah, in a way you are, but really all your deed, everything you do and say is, is being heard, assessed and interpreted by the patient subconscious. So, you know, a simple example, if you say to somebody, you know, you need to see me on Thursday next week, and then on Thursday they call up and say, oh, look, sorry, I can't come, and the receptionist or the CA says, yeah, no problem, let us know when you're next available, see you later. Um, the conscious mind of the person thinks, oh, what a lovely place, they're so friendly and they're so easygoing and they didn't even make me feel bad. Their subconscious is like, they were lying to you. when You, you know, the, back then last week when they said you need to be here on Thursday, well, you didn't really need to be here, otherwise they would have made a bigger point of it. And when, when you tried to cancel, like their subconscious is picking up on every little, every little bit of evidence that doesn't align with innate intelligence, which is a universal truth. So anything that's not truth, 
anything that's not um, gracious or um, it doesn't kind of carry that sort of deep value or deep honesty, it's like a red flag to the subconscious in my opinion. So, you know, you've got to start with a love of, a love of chiropractic, a love of Gonstead, a love and respect for the people that have come before you and made your life possible. And also gratitude for the natural given gifts that allow you to practice this. You know, if you didn't have a certain mind or you didn't have two arms and two legs, you, you know, you've been given a lot of gifts to start with. And so that's why even if a person is to say, give me a compliment, um, I never just take the compliment um, as if it's given to me. I always assume that, you know, this is a joint venture agreement. I'm, I'm in this with spirit or a higher power or my higher self um, and it's not about me it's about the person and um, yeah sorry the person that's come to see me um, and you know my victories although they feel good to me they are really victories for the patient because that's the whole reason we're there is to improve their health care and 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 shift their shift their vibration and sort of move them forward to a better place. And so if anybody comes in and says, for example, oh, look, I don't know what you did last time. It's just amazing. You know, my whole world's been shifted. You know, I'm just very happy for them. Um, I, I try not to sort of think, oh, well, gee, Ian, you're pretty amazing, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, David, you're asking me about like a, I guess, a tipping point. Thinking about it, it was around two to three years in, uh, we'd been working extremely hard. Like Joe and I both were quite happy to just be there 13 hours a day and just take any patient we could. Um, I had young children at the time, so I used to schedule breaks around taking them to school or picking them up or, um, you know, going to observe or watch a, a sporting event or something like that. So, you know, I didn't want to sort of be that distant parent, but at the same time, um, I would always pretty much other times throughout the day I'd be available for patients. Um, the tipping point was probably around about two or three years. We realised that there was probably a, there was a consistent few hundred dollars a week extra that we could either take as income or we could go and lease a car. And Joe's car was pretty good. Mine was terrible. I never knew if I was going to get where I was going. So I, I chose the car straight away. And I was really glad I did because, you know, I was just sick of getting pulled over on the side of the road and trying to fix something. And it was really nice to finally be able to drive somewhere knowing that the kids were going to get there. So, um, and then it was probably about the fifth year where, where all of our hard work really started to coalesce. Like we were, we were now making an income that you could actually, um, you'd actually live off. And that was the, that was the year that we took our first break. And we we took ten days from memory, and the, both of us went to Mount Horeb for a, um, the GCS homecoming seminar. And yeah, so that that was literally a turning point. The fact that you could have a holiday for ten days, get on an aeroplane, go to a seminar, and you know that when you got back, the whole place wasn't going to be rubble. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I would say I would say practice practice um it evolves in five year blocks i would I agree. say yeah i agree yeah yeah i've said that for years uh, that yeah you, you get yeah. these transition every five years you kind of get a transition a lot of times you don't even recognize the transition until you're out of it and then you look back and you go oh at that five years it it did it again and and it comes through yeah Exactly. Look, it's just popped into my head, but Tony Robbins says something that I think is 100% true. Not just, He talks about it in, in terms of finances, but I just think in general, um, people overestimate what they can accomplish in a year, but they underestimate what they can accomplish in a decade. And I just think that's really worth knowing because when you get up and, and it's hard slog and you get up and it's hard slog again, you don't realize that you're taking a step towards your destination. Like if you're focused on, and that's why I say it's really important to focus on 
the the higher ground type things you know you you look at your technique and um your philosophy and uh, how much you're helping people and how much you're contributing to the profession and you know how honorable are you in your exchange with your patients and if you focus on that you can't help but just always take a step in the right direction and it's amazing how much ground you can cover over a five to ten year period if you just live like that mm -hmm. so how how many years i just thought of this question actually how many years were you in practice before you started making the youtube videos Oh, a long time. Uh, um, about 17, 18 years. Okay. So then from... Yeah, I, probably, yeah, 17, 18 so years. So from that about, say, let's say, five-year mark up to that 17-year mark, um, were there any major, major transitions or anything that happened in there that, you, that was really noteworthy that you said, yeah, that's where we really went oh, to another level? Oh, it's so many. Yeah, look... Uh, I left. I left my original practice um, just short of the ten-year mark, and um, combination of having the practice and um, a young family, um, it was. I got quite burnt out around about that point, and that's something else that's well worth discussing: is that real potential for burnout if you don't put little stop points in place and, and have strategies for that. But, um, yeah, I had this, so I went to Japan. I, I was a, um, third Dan black belt and karate at the time. And I was going over there to do some training. And so I, I took six weeks off to go to Japan and, um, and do some training, some black belt, um, camps basically. And, I got very sick. I, de I developed a kidney infection out of nowhere. Like I got on the, I jumped on the airplane well, and I got off the airplane incredibly unwell. And basically, and I spent two weeks in a Japanese hospital. And um, yeah, so at that point, I decided, all right, well, I, I, I don't want, I don't want to be really sort of um what's crushing it you know moving forward I, I i want to see patients so i want to see people that want to see me or need to see me so i just rented a person uh, a room out of another friend's office really nice guy and um i just had this the tiniest room i couldn't even fit a high low in there so i just had a a, a bench a chair and a knee chest and yeah that the universe had different plans for me like it, within five or six months I couldn't fit any I couldn't fit in the building and I had to start looking for a place to to lease and you know it just started growing organically very quickly and then I took on an associate and um yeah it was one of those situations where the the plan the, the, the plan I had for myself and the outcome wasn't wasn't really matching up you know but it was a good problem to have. It was only because um, there was a lot of people that that wanted to see me, and um, I had to basically create the facility for that to happen. So that was a big turning point. Like I stepped into another practice quicker than or earlier than I thought I was going to. And my philosophy back then with associates was um, basically grow organically. Like when when there was a need for another person, I would bring the right person in. And in the way I selected the people was I always tried to select people that had qualities that you couldn't teach. And, but I was, you know, take people that the holes in their game were things that you could teach, but their higher qualities were things that you couldn't teach. Uh, there's no use having anyone in your practice if they don't have compassion, if they, they don't have empathy, if they don't care about whether a person gets well or not. Like the, all those things have to be there first. And so, yeah, I'd say that was a, that was a turning point. Uh, another turning point would be, by the, by the way, that practice got very busy, uh, got very busy, very quickly and that was long before 
the YouTube videos started. Um, but another thing happened, which sort of gave me, I think, great exposure to a lot of people around the world. For about five years in a row or so, I would fly out to Japan, uh, Paris, Spain. I think they were the main ones. Um, and I'd meet the GCS people like John Cox and his Gonstead team. And I would assist in the seminars in those countries every year for about five years. And what what that did was um, it gave me a great exposure to, you know, I just hung with those guys like Bill Dressler and Poe and and John and, and Alex, of course. And, um, and they just kind of being there and, and, and sort of, sort of, I guess, just vibing up the essence of those people that did it for real. And they were just so such nice people and so genuine. Um, you know, you were happy to spend the, the large sums of money that it cost you to go over there and do this and, and contribute. But it also, you know, you learn a lot from teaching and um, I learned a huge amount just from being there and teaching. Uh, but what I, what I didn't expect from that was that I sort of started to develop a bit of a profile because a lot of people that I would help when I was in these seminars, they would, you know, ask for my details and they would stay in contact. So uh, a lot of people were sending x-rays on a regular basis and cases and asking if I would assist them, you know, make some different choices to help them with these patients. And it was that actually that that prompted the the recording of cases at the practice because at one point um, my full-time um, office manager said, look, you know, you're in the practice at midnight, um, one in the morning answering these things. Um, why don't you, you know, you see these things all the time, like these, these cases that these patients have, why don't you take a video of them, edit it down to something small create a link, you know, you can keep, hold it on YouTube on a private and send it to these practitioners and you can send out one video and they can all ask you the same question and then you can punch out the answers. I thought, what a great idea. So that's how those videos started. But uh, like I said to you earlier, they, they were all on private for a long time. We had no intentions of making them public. Um, it was only because I had my arm twisted by my staff one day that I agreed to, <laughs> to make them public. And, you know, even that, so that was a turning point too. I was already busy and I was already receiving uh, referrals, like international referrals before those videos went out. Um, and so, but then when the, the big, I think the big thing with the videos was, in the early days, what would happen is a person would that, that knew me, because I mean, why else would you look at a video, chiropractic video that you know, <laughs> unless you knew the person? It's like, oh, I'll, I'll look at Doctor Ian's video because I know him. Um, but they would start to use these videos to send to their friends as a way of saying, hey, look, this is what this you know, this is what chiropractic is, this is what Gonstead is, this is what you're going to get if you go there. So the video started getting shared around as a way of referral, which I found was interesting. So that was a bit of a turning point. So, yeah, I think I think getting sick in Japan was a turning point, realising that, yeah, I had to protect myself a bit better from burnout was a turning point. I think getting forced to start the new practice just on pure demand was a turning point. And then learning how to hire staff as I grew organically yeah. was a big lesson. Um, and the international education, like the money that I put into that, was um, very valuable in terms of my own growth and sort of experience. Um, and seeing the value in paying money to get experience, I think, was really important too. Like that, that, those trips would cost me ten thousand dollars or so, um, and plus what you lose by not being in the practice. But you know, every cent of that was was money well spent to me because you know you just felt that you grew each time you did that. 
um, and you were better for it. I think it's really interesting that you got burnt out at 10 years because I got burnt out at 10 years. Although now in retrospect, I think I wasn't so much burnt out as overwhelmed. Um, but that overwhelm felt like burnout. And so I took a year off. And when I came back after that time off, I had an ability to generate patience without effort, like almost draw them in like a magnet that I didn't have before that. And it almost sounds like you had the same thing. And I, that's kind of weird because I just thought I just thought it was me. But I'm like, I wonder if there's something to that. Like you work really hard for a while, but it's almost like you it just gets piled on you so much that you're like, OK, I need to step back. And that's kind of what I did. I stepped back and I thought. I need to process all of this. And it took me about a year to really process and put everything in its place and be able to handle it and then come up with a plan for how I was going to come back. And then, like I said, once I came back, it was like patients started materializing out of nowhere that I had never seen in the first 10 years. And it was just this weird thing. So um, that's weird. I think there might yeah. be something to that. Oh, there is for sure. I think there's an energetic thing. Like, you know, whenever you let go is when the, is when you draw the thing to you. That's mm -hmm. the first thing. And the other thing is when you come from a place that we, we described earlier where it's a very kind of altruistic place, your people go where people go and you draw what you're good at. So, you know, by about 10 years in, it was very common and I'm sure it was the same for you, uh, you're seeing a lot of complicated pediatric cases. You're seeing a lot of complicated acute cases. You're seeing, um, you know, stuff that just you didn't expect to ever see as a chiropractor. All of a sudden, you know, you're sitting there looking at somebody who's just fallen off some, uh, you know, a construction site and they've got a few fresh con compression fractures and, you know, they, the person didn't like the the suggestion that they got from the hospital and the next minute they're on your doorstep just demanding that you take care of it. And like there's these really high end cases that just start coming in one after the other after the other. So, you know, you may be, you may be right. Like it could be the overwhelming nature of that. There's no coasting one. I think that's the, yeah, you've made me think of something too. You're right. Like there's that point where there's no coasting. You, you're on all the time and it you don't get um, I mean you do get some patients that are sort of old and they're in a corrective phase or you know every couple of months they might upset something and you have a look at them but um, yeah you're always challenged by the the degree and complexity of your next new patient yeah and once you've unlocked that box you don't really get to shove it all back in and take a break from it and so when you're at that point no. where you're, you're meeting the demand, but you're just barely meeting that demand and you take on the gravity of these people bringing you like really heavy <laughs> stuff, like to them, this is their whole life. And the gravity of that That's coming right. in, there's, there's a point at which just like, it's just too much from, it's too much to bear. It's so much, but um, I, I don't know, I guess over yeah. time you get better at that. Cause now I definitely noticed that does not weigh on me like it once did. I'm sure it doesn't weigh on you like it once did. And now it's like, okay, Let's get to business. Let's do what we need to do and let's make this person better. Yeah, that's very true. And that, that's one thing that came out of the the YouTube, like um, especially, like, like I said, I was already at capacity um, before we started making those videos and I already had people coming from overseas um, on a regular basis. But um, the one thing that, that did ramp up um, especially after probably a year or two of, of those videos being out was the level of complexity of the cases that would, mm. that would come. Mm -hmm. And, but it wasn't just that it was, you know, we get people from, you know, they might've injured themselves as a child in, you know, in India or, you know, Iraq, you know, people that have been in car bomb explosions or they've they had a, you know, balcony of a, um, of an apartment sort of, collapse because of a bomb and they're sort of pulled out of the rubble and they're only nine or 10 years old. And then, you know, they live with that for until they're 19 or 29 or 59. And then, so there's the complexity of the, the physiological damage to the, to their bodies. There's the neuro emotional and um, psychosocial overlay that sits with a traumatic event like that. And then on top of that, you've got, like the the 
the deeper intrinsic complications related to compensations, which long-term compensations, as we know, are trauma and they can become primary. So you've got these like layers of issues that you're dealing with. Um, but the biggest thing when it comes to, if you look at um, pressure on me as a practitioner, the awareness that their plan to be in my office might have started two years ago. Mm -hmm. So these people without much money, and they're financial they financial. would literally... Their Pardon? financial commitment, because you're right, you get people from India and places like that, and they may have scraped together every penny they had just to make that flight, hoping it would change their life. 100%. That's what I was getting at. So, you know, I, I know for a fact, and this is like probably half of them or more, um, they'll actually spend two years saving up yeah. for that flight and accommodation. And the other complex, and, and so there's a the, the onus on you to give them a good outcome is, is huge. And, um, and, and I'm, I'm glad that I'm glad I wasn't faking it, you know? <laughs> so with those videos, we, we were accused of having, you know, paid actors and all this garbage, That's but, right, yeah. um, yeah, but I was just lucky. I had, a, I had amazing mentors and I dedicated my life to being good at this thing. I'm not saying I'm, you know, better than any other people that are good because I'm, I think all of us at, at a certain level are doing the same thing. Um, and that's what, that's where the brotherhood comes from. Like the, the fact that, you know, you and another girl in another place um, in a, another country is all, we're all doing the, getting up in the morning and doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's amazing. Like it's really heartwarming, yeah. but the, the biggest thing that the, the extra layer of stress that I wasn't ready for was knowing that someone spent their life savings to be in my office and they've got, you know, equal to the most complicated problem that you could probably imagine in a chiropractic office and they don't live around the corner. So you can't just manage them prop normally. Like, you know, these people will often come for five days and, you know, you've got to turn their world around in five days. So, you know, everything that you learnt about, um, you know, subluxation selection and um, correction and sort of the, um, the order that you do things in and um, the sequence of events that you take to get someone from how they present to you to their their highest potential um all of a sudden those rules are very very different you don't you don't have six weeks mm -hmm. um and so that's been a real learning curve for me is to figure out how to fast track results and and really kind of sit deep in the the frequency of that person's body and kind of feel how hard can I push this? Um, and because what you've got to do to, to take these really complicated people and and make big shifts in them in a short period of time is you've got to be, um, it sounds weird, but you've got to almost be inside their body and you've got to be really trying to connect to how much can I do in one moment and how hard can I push each component of this and how quickly can I do it again mm -hmm. and what order can I do it in so that, and then the other thing is to get them to understand that the correction happens in the office, but the healing happens outside the office. So even though they might only be in the office for five days, um, if we do the right job, the effect of what we're doing and the, the healing and the compensation and the adaption is going to keep happening over the next six to eight weeks to even potentially months. And um, that's one thing that I've learned about chiropractic practicing this way is that it's very, very important for us to realize that we're putting the body in a position to heal so that we can allow the body to go and do the healing. And sometimes um, that healing um can create massive shifts for a person, even two, three, four months mm -hmm. after you stopped adjusting them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So now um, let's kind of finish up by going to where you are now. What is what does your practice look like now? How many how many doctors are in there? How much staff do you have? I know you have staff. 
<laughs> well, this has changed a lot in the last few years. <clears throat> um, it was only a few short years ago um, that we had, I think, six um, six of us all together from memory, and we had, I think, we had thirteen or fourteen staff. And if you saw my office, by the way, it's not big. It it looks quite big on the um, on the videos, I think, sometimes. But people are very surprised to see how small it is. We basically have a hallway with four rooms, and um, it's um, yeah, it's it's a it's a phenomenal <laughs> it's a phenomenal sort of. I, I don't know, I can't even explain, but the, the staff at the front do an amazing, well, especially back then when it was like that, the staff did an amazing job just shifting people from room to room. We've got four change rooms um, that that don't feed into actual rooms. They're just like four change rooms next to each other. And we've got the x-ray room behind that and we've got four adjusting rooms. And we've got two waiting rooms, one at the front and one down where the... Um, x-ray room and back two rooms are which is where the change rooms are and we just have this system of rotating people um through each part of the practice that they need to be in it's um the last couple of years changed things a lot um we had a, a lot of our staff were really um i guess really tested by the way the the state was treated on a whole like we you know we had pretty severe lockdowns and we we had our practice shut down for a while and we had you know the mandates come through and there was all these various things and um you know i stepped out of the practice because my mum was very ill with advancing dementia about the same time as the mandates came through so that was in a way a bit fortunate well the timing i guess was fortunate none of it was fortunate um, <laughs> um but yeah, it, a lot of my staff were really tested by that, and um, so we lost some we lost some associates. We um, yeah, we were getting like random audits by government bodies and um, checking to make sure that thing there was compliance, and you know where there wasn't compliance, there was um, yeah, it was a it was a shocking time really, but. We, we managed to live through it and now currently we have um, we have one, two, three associates and myself. Uh, so there's four of us now. Um, the practice is not as busy as it was, but it's getting there again. Um, and The really exciting thing about our practice is the type of people that are in the building. We, on any given day, will have <clears throat> a couple of people from India, a couple of people from Iraq, a couple of people from Europe somewhere, a couple of people from the States. We'll have a few people that have driven or flown from interstate in Australia. Um, we always have our fair share of emergencies and that are littering the hallways and <laughs> you're squeezing them in between. And, um, you know, I've got uh, two of my daughters that work in the practice. So essentially there's a you know, strong family component and the other staff that are there are just fantastic at the moment. Um, the... the um, the sort of agitation and sort of, I guess, um, or whatever the word is, I don't know, that that existed over the last year or two where the other associates and practitioners were sort of finding the best place for them in amongst the challenge of the mandates and government um, rules and regulations um, and the stresses that came with that. Um, yeah, we're sort of we're sort of pushing into a phase where things are really sort of balancing out, and the the morale and the energy and the the, the um, just the vibe in the practice is is really good again, which is which is great. Um, my personal practice is quite interesting, to say the least. Um, 
we we have color codes for if somebody's a re-examination, like if they haven't been in for a year or more, if they've recently injured themselves, um, if they're an emergency, um, if they come from another country, if they come from interstate, like they're all color coded differently. Um, so, but I don't know whether I, th- I I don't know whether to look at it as if my staff like to punish me or they've just got ultimate confidence in me. I'm not sure which one it is, but um, so they'll just fill up my book to a cross all the way down, and they're all new patients, re-exams, emergencies, blah blah blah. Like um, it, if you look at the, like these my bookings, you would you would expect the way they run it to a cross it you know, I've just got this nice family practice and I've got lots of maintenance people and they come in every couple of months and we have a chat and, you know, adjust their T6 and say goodbye. But no, <laughs> uh, they're all they're all crisis management, but they're all just crammed in there. And people, people are warned that there's going to be a wait and people understand. But what I would say to anyone is in practice, everything is an opportunity to educate. So even if someone gets a bit upset because, you know, you know, they live five minutes away and they, they've been waiting for 45 minutes is, you know, we say, look, sorry, but, you know, Dr. Rusper's had a few people from overseas today and a couple from interstate. And then there's this, you know, somebody's just been hit by a car and they've come in too. So that's why it's behind, but we'll get you in first. And in the future, we don't want this to happen to you again. Um, do you mind if we um, give you an update as it gets closer and then you can stay home until it's time to come and then you can rest? You know what I mean? Like we, we sort of use these, we, we never leave people out and we never just get big headed about our situation. We, um, we, we really sort of appreciate. In fact, we're sort of humbled by the fact that so many good people want to come and see us, but, I am really challenged by the demand on my time. Mm-hmm. I, I think that's the hardest part. And, and it's the thing that when you're saying trying to prepare for a burnout or overwhelmed, whichever one it is, it is that it's the demands mm-hmm. on your time. And then if something happens in your family, that increases the demand on your time, but you can't shift anything at work. You just suddenly feel like it's over the top. It's too much. Yeah. So, um, what I'm trying to do at the moment is transition into a, a phase where I get my associates to assist a lot more. Um, it's it's tough on them though. Like even though we run a shared care situation where I get my associates involved in a lot of the care, it is it is hard on them because they haven't sort of been through the, the same tests and trials in of, in chiropractic that I've been through. So. Um, sometimes there is a bit of a gap between where I'm at and where my associate is. And um, so, um, but, you know, like that's not to take away from them because they're brilliant. They're really very good. And, um, but what I'm trying to do moving forward is just to have a couple of days where I consult in the practice and, and other days where I sort of work on the practice, but from a distance and sort of relinquish a lot of the care or the ongoing care of these people to the associates. Um, and we also refer out a lot too. You know, we try and find, because we have people come from all over the world, we try and find people closer to where they live to follow up their care. Um, you know, and on that point, I'd love to do a shout out to the profession and just say, look, please, um, you know, I don't want to sound superior and I'm not pretending that I'm better than anybody, but everybody just if they could work as hard as they could to be as good as they could because um, it's not always easy to find somebody who's qualified to take care of a, a really unwell patient um, and you know it's it's kind of come back to bite us a few times where we've referred out and then they've said well why did you do that you know the person hurt me or I, I, um, that's not as common as I just didn't thrive you know I didn't go well I, you know I feel like I started to go backwards um, but um yeah i think as a profession i think that's what we need to do more of is maybe inter refer more um we need i don't know what it's like in the states or other parts of the world but uh, in australia we we tend not to we do we get we do a little bit of cross referral but nothing like we should you know nothing where you sort of recognize that someone's got 
vastly more experienced and then you, you hand your difficult person over to them. So at least they're kept within the profession. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's better than losing a patient from the profession because my wife likes to point this out that if somebody goes to a medical doctor and they don't get the help they need, they go, well, that was a bad doctor. And then they go to another medical doctor. But in chiropractic, they go to a chiropractor and they get a bad result. They go, chiropractic's worthless. And they go to a medical doctor. And that's basically what happens. So it's true. We yeah. got to make sure we're not losing them out of the profession. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And look, there's, I think there's just so many things that young chiropractors or people that have been at it for a while, but, you know, it's just that those kind of big shifts didn't come, you know, like they, like those, um, you know, you mentioned that hump before, mm -hmm. like that, that hump is, is always there for some people. Um, and look, you know, I don't think there's, there's, there's none of us that have been blessed with, you know, the divine, like we, I don't think there's any of us that just, you know, touch every, every soul and they just, you know, jump to their full potential. Yeah. Um, but I do think there's certain things that you can do to improve your averages and improve your strike rate and um, increase the difficulty and the, the, the type of patient that, that you can manage. And a lot of it comes with, um, like I said before, you know, not to repeat myself, but just to just come from a place of a love for the profession and a love for um, a love for a, a love for what Gonstead Chiropractic's been able to to lay out for us. And the I'm just choosing my words a bit carefully because I. I don't want to offend anybody and, and I don't want to appear superior because that's not how I feel at all. But I just, I, I really feel like even somebody who's been in practice a long time and and some of the things that we talk about, they don't sound like they're happening for them or even like these types of patients that we see. Um, I know some people are thinking, well, you know, that's silly. I would never see a person like that and neither should you because, you know, who would see somebody with a, a failed surgery and, you know, a cage holding three vertebrae together and, you know, you correct within a millimeter of that to reduce their nerve irritation. Like nobody would touch that and nobody should, but I'm saying, yeah, people do touch that and we should because chiropractic done well is it's degrees and millimeters. And if you get down to that specificity and you, you align with what the patient needs and you dedicate your life to getting good at this, um, the the scope of our practice is, I, I think it's almost boundless, and um, but it all starts with having a love and respect for the profession and and the central tenets of that that drive us. You know, the central tenets of what makes up the power of a subluxation, what makes up the power of an adjustment. I'm not sure if I'm making sense. Well, it reminds me you earlier. Um you were talking about Alex and the first time you went to a seminar. And I agree. The first time I went to a mm -hmm. seminar and I heard Alex and Doug talking and I thought, this is the first time in chiropractic somebody's told me truth. But the other thing they did for me is they set such a higher expectation of what could be done in chiropractic. And then earlier you were telling my wife and I that what you did to um, with releasing the videos, part of your motivation was to show people what was possible in chiropractic. And I think sometimes that's what gets lost. Even those of us who do it, we sometimes forget, even if we get in our little, our little, uh, our little ball of experience or our little office or whatever, and we're seeing patients. And maybe if we don't get a crazy case for a while, that if the effect of that can be that you start to forget just how powerful chiropractic is and just what it can do. And, and it's helpful to be reminded sometimes of, of what can happen. I, I wasn't, so I wasn't good at Anyway, my, my son, one day I came home and my son, I left a portable table in the front in our front room. Um, because I had been, I think I had to adjust him actually. So I left this portable table sitting up. I came home and he had made himself an office where he had his little computer desk, where he turned my wife's little hutch into his computer desk. He had the portable table and he'd set up his teddy bear on a chair and said that was the waiting room. And he, he had his own little thing going. And so he decided that he was gonna do chiropractic stuff. And so then um, he's like, can you show me videos of any of your friends? And I was like, um, okay. So I actually pulled up one of yours and showed him. And so he was watching this video but then it was just kind of funny, even for him, he was like, 
I know you go to work every day, but I didn't always know what all you do. Like, I, I realized even somebody yeah. that close, he didn't really even know what kind of people I saw or what I did. And the only reason my wife really knew is because a lot of my patients became her patients. And, now, and so then they would share it with her. But from I realized that even my own children don't really even know. And so it's so easy to lose sight of what we can do and, and how we do it and what can happen. And I think it's helpful to be constantly motivated so that you're, you're setting your sights higher, the whole uh, aim for the stars. And even if you've missed, you've still gone really high kind of idea that, that we need to yeah. do those things. Definitely. Um, you know, I think the people that know what we do the most, are the, the people that receive the right adjustment at the right time and you know the shift that they experience then in in that instant they know whoa this is much bigger and much more different than what i thought it was um i i think our patients are probably the most qualified to say what we do but outside of that i would say yeah i totally agreeing with you not only does our often our family not know exactly what we do um, I think there's components of our pro own profession that don't really know what we do. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the medical profession and other allied professions certainly don't know what we do. Um, and, you know, that's not entirely their fault, but, you know, I think their impression of what we do is we're going to twist somebody up and jump on them. And, you know, we all have patients say, oh, you know, for example, they might have a few disbulges and, um, and a failed surgery and they'll say, oh, look, my surgeon said I should never let anybody touch my back. And I'd say, yeah, you know, no offense to your surgeon whatsoever, but what he thinks I'm going to do is twist you up at, like a sausage and jump on you. And if that is what was going to happen, I would say don't do it too. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's not what we're going to do. And then, you, you know, you go about explaining mm -hmm. what it is that you look for and what, what you're what you're aiming to achieve and um and that's where those you know really amazing results you know that's how we get those really amazing results but it's yeah i think it's just really important that we all remember that it's always about the patient it's never about us and that's when that's when you actually do go to those higher levels of expertise like you've actually managed to achieve those higher levels of expertise mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, I think that's the part people crave is they want to know how to get there, but they don't have a roadmap for it. And so it's always my no. it's my motivation to try to figure out how to help them have a roadmap, how to try to figure out how to get there for themselves. Well, I jotted a few things down before I came on. I'm not sure if we've got time. Sure. Is it, go have we got, <laughs> all right. So this is I was just I was assuming that, you know, I mean, obviously, there are people that know more about chiropractic than I do, and there are people that are more skilled in chiropractic than I do. Uh, I am, but um, there's you know, this was more for people that are like starting out, or they've been out for a while, out for a while, and they just don't feel like they're thriving. Um, so, um, I'll just kind of flick through this. So, you know, there's a few things that I think you should keep in mind when you're starting out in practice or if you've been in for a while. One of them is that, like I said earlier, everything that happens is an opportunity to educate. So it really doesn't matter. Like even if a person comes in and says, well, you know what, I'm a little sore after, after your correction on Monday, that's an opportunity to explain to them, you know, why they're sore, what a compensation is, what spinal adaption is, and so on and so on. And... I think a lot of people, people that are practicing from a um, practice management model point of view, they're not as they're not as scared by these patient comments because they've been given a dialogue to attend to it. But when you are practicing from a, a a Gonstead point of view, where you're actually really trying to tap in to the the body's capacity to heal, and you're really making changes to primary subluxations. There are certain things that we're going to expect in our patients that others might not, and it's very important to explain those to people. Uh, I think the foundation of the doctor-patient relationship is in the history and the report of findings. So that's where that's where the 
the patient's really making a decision whether you're their doctor or not, um, or you know whether you're their person. And they're also finding out in that instant how much do they trust you. So, um, you know, I'd encourage people to really, you know, delve into the patient on that first meeting and um, be very clear about and, and explain why. Like, it's important for the patient to understand what it is you're looking for and what it is you're finding and what it is you intend on doing. Because, you know, like a lot of the old timers have said, and I think Gonstead himself said, that it's not a belief system, it's not a religion. We don't want you to believe that it works. We don't want you to believe in chiropractic. We want you to understand it. And I think that's really important too. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I like, even though I've been talking a lot in these videos, um, I like the little acronym WAIT, like why am I talking? Um, you, We speak too much when we're with patients and um, we almost we almost trip ourselves into this kind of space where um, we de-educate the patient rather than educate them. So um, always stop and ask yourself, is what you're saying to the patient actually helping them? Like is what you're saying for them or is it for you? Mm-hmm. Because anything you do for them is, is going to be, it's going to be the, the, like for the benefit of the actual whole experience. Um, don't ever forget that we're dealing with innate intelligence and um, innate intelligence being a universal truth means that you, like we touched on before, you know, you have to sit in truth all the time. Um, Just having a quick look. When we, with chiropractors are basically time travelers, like we're, we're st- when we see a patient, no matter what they've got, no matter how complicated it is, we're, we're trying to step back in time. We're trying to sort of look back to when that thing started. And um, I think that's a really good way for somebody to think because even if, some, if someone's been in pr- chiropractic for a while um, and they're starting to sort of struggle or those, those humps, they start to appear more often, I think it's because they've inadvertently drifted away from the focus on the subluxation and they've been drawn in by the the symptoms of the person. Do you know what I mean by that? Yeah. Um, and if you, as a practitioner of chiropractic, if you're chasing symptoms, you're bound to get dizzy, you know, you'll just end up running around in circles. So, um, yeah, most comp- most most subluxations that we find we identify and correct, they're years old, and they came from some etiology. Like it was either a trauma, a fall, an accident, or it could be that plus a combination of poor adaption since then, and so on. But you need to sort of like use get intimate with the person to the point where you can go almost go back in time and see how the thing happened at the time and correct it as if it was an acute injury. Uh, I don't know if that's making sense to people, but that's something that I, I think is, if you grasp that, it's a, it's a really good concept to sort of take home. What it makes me think of is the, um, the idea that we think of Gonstead as fixing people quickly, which it does, but that's not the same thing as always trying to set the bone as deeply as you possibly can. That sometimes the fastest mm. route there um, I've often used the baseball analogy. You can hit a home run or you can hit four singles, or sometimes you just need to bunt the, ba- the bunt, the runner around. Like there's times when yeah. you're going to get the best benefit by doing the least to get the most. And that there's, there's this um, sometimes tendency to want to be too overly aggressive with it. And you're right. You really have to have a sense of the patient to know what is going to do them the best. Yeah, exactly right. And, um, yeah, I, I don't like the word dose because it sounds like, you know, dose of medication, but like definitely um, as you get better at this. All right, so there's a few central tenets of the Gonstead system that are really important. One of them is that we we adjust the vertebra in a neutral joint space. We take out all the, the directions of the listing um, or the misalignment. We, we take them out in the setup and then we create an 
open anterior joint space to have somewhere to set the vertebra to. But once we're there, the, the vital thing, and I think this is what's missed by a lot of people, is you've got to palpate with your contact hand where the fixation is. So, you know, even when you take out those planes of motion, um, there's a point where if you direct your line of correction, you, you basically, you know, you know, set that force into a, a mobile segment of the joint. But what you want to do is find where the nucleus is and you want to set to the nucleus if possible. Mm -hmm. So, um, but every subluxation is going to have a different um, end feel or not an end feel at all, sorry, but a feel when I... For, when I say end feel, I mean the feeling on the end of your finger or the end of your contact. So, and when you get to the neutral joint space and then you you, you find the angle that um, uncovers that fixation component, the feedback that you get from that fixation will give you an idea about what the depth and speed and amplitude um, of your thrust needs to be. So you need to grade it to what you're feeding back or what you're getting feeding back to you from the patient and um and a lot of that comes obviously a lot of that comes from being intimately connected to the patient but a lot of it also comes from taking your mind like actually seeing that subluxation form when it formed and how it formed so that's what i mean by sort of going back in time yeah, yeah. and it's yeah. like uh, and it's it's like subluxation recreation, like a forensic science. Where yes, you're figuring yes, out yeah. here's the forces that went into this that caused it to be in the position it's now stuck in. Yeah, yeah. So, and I I think that's it's a game changer for some people if they haven't thought of things that way. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, there's all sorts of. I think the basic central tenets of Gonstead chiropractic are the most important things to keep in mind. Um, like I, I wrote a ton of stuff there, which I won't read out to you because I don't want to put anyone to sleep. But um, but it, there's things that I'd love to leave with, especially students or people just starting out. And one is that we're always sending a dysfunctional segment to a functional segment. Yes. So when 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 people, when we talk about, you know, stable foundation and and those various rules in chiropractic, um, you can kind of get a bit lost. Like some people might think, well, that means you set the ileum before C6, like, um, for example. That might be where their concept of stable foundation starts and ends. Um, now, you don't always do that, by the way. I've just said that. Um, but, like, the true like the most useful expression and definition of stable foundation is to remember that you're always taking a dysfunctional segment and setting it to a functional segment. Now that, that could like, even in an ileum, you're setting, you're setting the ileum to the sacrum or you're setting the sacrum to the ileum or you're setting L4 to L5, but whatever you're doing, whatever it is, you're setting this dysfunctional segment to the functional segment. Um, so that's, I'll leave that there. We could go about that all day. Um, the, the adjustment occurs in a neutral joint space. We talked about that. Um, and the fact that the, the, um, the setup takes out all the components of the sub of the listing. Um, but the correction is to the fixation and to set to where the nucleus is or to where the heart of the joint is. So, um, that's, another really important thing to kind of get your head around. Like if a, if a vertebra has gone, you know, um, posterior right, now say, say it's gone PRS, you know, you've got to have an, a concept of where the nucleus is getting pushed. And you, when you set that dysfunctional segment to the functional segment, you'll usually find the fixation part, the component of the subluxation that's been corrected is in relation to where the nucleus has moved or to where the swelling of the capsule is in another joint that doesn't have a disc. So again, we'll talk, we probably don't want to talk about that too much, but I think um, having a concept of like a deeper concept of what it is you're trying to do is what's going to get you into the next level and the next level and the next level of care. Um, uh, 
the concept that a good adjustment might take a number of corrections, I think that's worth thinking about for people that are starting out. Um, and this is what you were saying, I think, about the baseball analogy, but always only set to what the body can accept mm. because you're, you're, you're making a correction for the sole purpose of removing nerve irritation and putting the body in a, in a position where it can heal. So um, the maximum benefit you're going to get for that patient is to correct something only to the point that they can accept it and not beyond it. Um, and like I said before, the, 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 the depth and speed of the correction is gauged by the level of fixation that you get in feedback um, when you... But, but it's not fixation in end field. That's really important to remember students. Like it's, you've taken it to a neutral joint space and then within that neutral joint space, you're, you're going to play with some vectors that vary by millimetres and then there'll be a point where you feel the resistance coming back to you. That's where you need to pick the vertebra up and sit it onto that part of the joint. That's the fixation component that's important. And just... And, you know, I'm sorry if I've stated the obvious to, you know, thousands of people that have already know this, but the ones that don't know this, I think it's, it does allow you to get to that next level of care. Yeah, that's a great way to, to explain that because um, that's a concept that I've always struggled to figure out how do you verbalize this. But, yeah, that's exactly it is maintaining that neutral joint space but finding the fixation within the neutrality. Yes. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, well, thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate it. Uh, as always, we have to figure out time zones and everything. So it's great when we can figure out a way to make it all work. So I thank you for, for coming on. No, it's a pleasure, David. And, um, <clears throat> you know, if if we ever do this again, um, always feel free to sort of put the put the shepherd's hook and sort of pull me off stage or shut me up. I, I do but, enough episodes that are just me that I like to let the guests talk as much as they want so that people aren't just listening to me all the time. <laughs> it's a difficult thing because the audience is so varied and, um, but, but I am really aware that you were pitching this one to, um, I guess people that were starting in practice or in that sort of phase of practice where they're just thinking, Oh, is the tough stuff ever going to end? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I hope I haven't sort of overdone it, but I was just really trying to give people a few tools to um, to be comfortable in their discomfort. That's really important. Like just know that the discomfort's actually taking you further than you could possibly imagine and don't sacrifice your principles. Don't get seduced into doing, end, you know, end range of motion corrections or manipulations and, um, you know, don't, get seduced into like fancy marketing ploys and, you know, like extensive dialogues to get patients to come back and see you more often because if you just stay in love with chiropractic, stay in love with Gonstead in particular, find good mentors that can assist you. Um, your ability to create massive shifts in people's health care and their, well, their state of well-being will make you busier than you can possibly imagine. And um you even if you don't help a person if you practice that way you can walk past them on the street and with a really open smile say hey how you going and give them a nice handshake because um you've got nothing to hide from um that person knows that you you operated from within um with integrity and the entire way and you did everything you possibly could to help them and no one will ever hold that against you um and the other thing is people don't they don't ever care about paying money but they do pay they do care about paying money um for poor results or no results mm -hmm. um and there is a like a last little thing just to the students and new graduates there is a thing called equal exchange and all humans feel like they, they need to have this feeling of that the exchange was equal. Um, so, you know, just give your whole heart to the person and give every aspect, you know, every, every ounce of your ability to the person and um, 
win, lose or draw, um, they will, um, you'll, you'll keep your honour and you'll keep improving and you'll get better and better and um, people will respect you for it along the journey. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so thank you again for giving up your time to come on here. I appreciate it. No worries, David. Um, my pleasure. All the best to everybody.